and welcome to the Doofcast, a film and TV podcast from Doof Media. I am your host, Scott Daly, and joining me as always, he's penis cancer in human form. It's Matt Freeman. Oh, how you doing, asshole? <laughs> you know, the problem with that introduction is there are people that listen to the show uh, that have not watched the movies, and uh-huh. they're not going to get why I just called you penis cancer. No, no, but that's that's the whole thrust of this series is mm-hmm. we're trying to bring back the idea that movies are fun and you should watch them <laughs> because Even the, it, the academy it, nominated ones yeah i mean this used to be an idea this used to be <laughs> back when we were a proper country people would go see movies <laughs> and then they would go watch the academy awards together to see how the movies did and competing against each other and now nobody sees movies and thus nobody cares about the academy <laughs> awards and it's 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 bad for society i'll say it i'll say it did you see stephen king's tweet about the oscars um remind me bless bless his little heart but Mm -hmm. he's never been he's never been more wrong he tweeted the oscar nominations and movie going tastes are pretty much parted company and i'm like the two highest grossing films of the year were nominated for best picture what are you talking Uh about yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he meant all the other ones. I. I mean, I guess so. It, it's interesting because popular taste in this moment of time is a strange beast because it's no longer true to be like, oh, those those plebs. They love the they love their superhero trash and their. And it's like, no, no, they don't actually. Yeah, no, they're they're sick of it. That, 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 what they actually wanted this year was the incredibly intense biopic and the art house film about Barbie. Yeah. So. <laughs> so here we are in the, the 2024 Oscars. And that is what this series is all about, um, because today we are, are reaching part four of our ongoing series, taking a look at the 10 Best Picture nominees in time for the 2024 Oscars. Um, Matt, I, I just want to say this here right now. At the beginning of the show, we're going to talk about the Academy Awards near the end of the show. But right now, um, I got all 10 correct on my my best picture nominees. I, I got them all. Congratulations. Thank you. I, Thank I know you. this is a big moment for you and everyone everyone applaud Scott right now. I, I was feeling really good about myself and then I listened to a podcast on Tuesday morning that was a reaction to the Oscars and one of the first things the host said was it has never been easier to predict the best <laughs> picture nominees. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Fuck you." Yeah. I got uh, it right. Leave me alone. Yeah, that's. That, <laughs> I mean, that's that's silly because cl- clearly there, there's got to be a couple that were marginal, right? It can't be that there were exactly <laughs> ten movies that were just so much better than every other movie out this year. Yeah, I mean, there were. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but there were some films that I thought maybe would push some other films out uh, of my list, and and I definitely was planning on putting those at like the very end and hoping that. You know, we we could pivot easily on those, but uh, it didn't happen. All 10 mm-hmm. of the ones that I put on my initial list were nominated. And so we're just going to go be full speed ahead with this whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Speaking of which, this week we are going to be taking a look at Alexander Payne's character drama nominated for the Best Picture Academy Award titled The Holdovers. Um so we're talking all about this wonderful movie. And then, uh, as I said, the Oscar nominations are officially out. They came out on Tuesday, and I thought we could have a quick conversation at the end of the show about them because I think this is a, a more relevant thing to us than it has ever been before in the previous years because we, we're we on our way to watching all these movies. Awesome. Sounds good. All right, Matt, let's get into it, though. Let's talk about Alexander Payne's The Holdovers. You don't tell a boy that's been left behind at Christmas? That nobody wants him? What's wrong with you? There's nobody here, okay? You stay out of my way, and I'll stay out of yours. Let me sleep in the Now, most of the kids dislike you, pretty much hate you. Teachers, too. You know that, right? I find the world a bitter and complicated place, and it seems to feel the same way about me. I think you and I have this in common. I don't think I've ever had a real family Christmas like this before. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. What is this movie all about? This movie is about a cranky history teacher at a remote prep school who is forced to remain on campus over the holidays with a troubled student who has no place to go and a grieving cook. This movie was written by David Hemmingson. It is, of course, directed by Alexander Payne, and it stars Paul Giamatti, Divine Joy Randolph, and introducing in his debut role, Dominic Sessa, 
as a uh, as the young boy. This is his first acting performance ever, Matt. Amazing. Ever. Yeah. So, all right. What did you think of the holdovers? Uh, my first reaction was they don't make him like this anymore. Um, <laughs> and and I think you're you, when I quipped that to you earlier, you know, testing out my jokes before the podcast. Um, you you basically said, yeah, that's kind of on purpose. Mm -hmm. uh it 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 very much feels like a movie from a from a previous era um in every way in every manner like the the way it's shot um even sort of the way it's written um the the kind of story that it is really though is what i meant it 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 feels like the kind of feel-good movie um about people you know normal people and their struggles that we just haven't I, i haven't watched in a while i'm not saying they don't make movies like this anymore i'm just saying i haven't seen a movie a new movie that felt like this in like 10 years. <laughs> so um, I, I and, and also on top of that, I had a really good time with it. I thought it was um, pl- very, very um, just well-made. Paul Giamatti is one of the best actors in the world. Mm-hmm. Always thought so. Um, and, and just had a great time with it. what do you think? Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think um, this movie takes place in 1970 and it is a movie that is shot to look like it, came out in 1970 i mean even like the detail of like the uh studio logos that that start the movie are the 1970 counterparts of the logos you know Mm -hmm. they're made to look like old logos and it's not just that it's it's the editing of the movie the camera like the cinematography it is very much a movie that is made to look like it was made during this time period that it takes place in and and i and i agree with you they don't make movies like this anymore um and these are my jam, <laughs> man. I, I love these types of movies. And it's so weird because, you know, this is our fourth movie in the series. We got a, a few movies to go still. But like, if you look at the movies we've covered so far, you have like the the, the biggest movie of the year, like a, a cultural milestone of this this whole taking the bar- Barbie concept and making a movie that is universally beloved. And then we have two, three hour plus epic stories of uh, examinations of humanity and and one of the worst <laughs> things we've ever created and then also an, an an exploration in killers of the flower moon of moon of of just the potential to how terrible and awful we as people can be these are these big towering important massive films and then you have this movie and it's a small like three part character study about three sad people spending time with each other and maybe learning how to be a little less sad and that's it and yet i think i like it more than all of those other movies i I, like i i think this is my favorite of the movies we've covered so far because i i think it is beautifully written beautifully performed it is just the type of movie that you just you kind of fall in love with and and i and yeah they don't they don't make these anymore uh really and i'm so glad they made this one yeah, definitely in terms of leaving you with a sort of clear feeling of of catharsis, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um yeah, just just uh, old-fashioned good down-home storytelling, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Like it's yeah. it's just solid. Um it, it's uh it, it's interesting because there were parts where I was like I was aware of how long the movie is because it's like what two 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 it's a little bit over two hours, right? Yeah, it's like it's like it's a it's Ridley Scott time. I think it's like two hours and fifteen minutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Ridley Scott uh, unit, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's it's one Ridley Scott is what it is. <laughs> um, so so, but like it's it was interesting because I was like I said I was aware that it was a long movie and I was like, you know, it, it but not in a bad way. It was like it's giving these dialogue scenes time to breathe. It's giving yeah. us a real sense of the progression of the relationships between these characters and you could kind of like I, I was really thinking about this because i was like there's a scene where um paul giamatti and, and the kid go to like a diner and you you could kind of cut out that whole scene mm-hmm. and the movie would function now i'm not saying like you, you, you could rightly point out like well, what about this moment what about this moment like, like important sort of structural character moments happen in that scene But you could just kind of redistribute those moments and put them elsewhere. The point is you could definitely trim the movie and make it shorter. But I think that would be at the cost of losing this feeling of like these two characters who are very uh, 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 retreated into themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, um, Like really kind of both like genuinely unlikable when we first meet them in, in very different ways. 
and the very gradual loosening and sometimes even like backsliding, like sort of like you think their relationship has hit some new point of depth and then something kind of goes wrong and then they blow up at each other and, and you feel like you, you've, you've backslid. Um, all of that, I think, is part of the uh, part of what makes it so good. It's part of what makes it work and part of what makes that catharsis at the end feel so earned is yeah. um, the, the, the time that we took to get there. Yeah, and and they've both got you know such a such guard up and such a shield they're putting around them that it is really you kind of need time to see them start to feel the other person out through this like because they are diametrically opposed in, in many ways and yet as as we learn throughout the course of the movie very very similar as well mm-hmm. um and and they need time for them to realize that and yeah it doesn't happen all at once and and i i agree with you i love that the movie gives us time to have moments of of conflict between them and then moments of catharsis but then something else comes up and it pushes them back against each other a little bit and and it, it just the 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 two characters bouncing off of each other in ways dramatic uh sad profound all like it just it needs it needs time. It really does. And and that's I think at the end of the day, when we talk about they don't make movies like this anymore, that's I think the part that we're mostly talking about is is a movie that that not only is is making these characters and their ordeals like it is the story, but mm-hmm. it allows that story time to unfold in a way that, as you said, makes that final moment makes makes uh, Paul Giamatti's choice at the end of the movie like so much more profound and I'm trying to think how I want to phrase this because there's, there's a thing with movies like this where you're like, what is going to happen at the end? Like how, how are Mm -hmm. they going to change? You know, like there was a part of me, you know, when, when he's having the conversation with, with uh, the kid and, and he says in the museum in Boston, when he's like, you know, if you, if you taught a little bit more like this, maybe people would like you more. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there's a part of my mind that goes, is that going to be the end that he's going to be learning to be like a, a softer, kinder type of teacher? And like, even as I thought that there's something that felt wrong about it because mm-hmm. I just don't, I don't buy that for that character. Like, like, I don't think you, you don't, you don't like the, the Ebenezer Scrooge transformation mm-hmm. doesn't actually happen ever. Yeah. Right. Like, that's not a thing. That's not, it, right. it, it is functional in that fun story, but like no one actually behaves that way. And like what you will get was like incremental, incremental progress and a, and a, and a little bit of kindness. And that's, I think what works so well about the ending of this movie is that like he does, he does the very thing that he argued with the headmaster at the beginning of the movie that he could not do, which was, uh, you know, lie or stretch mm-hmm. the rules of the organization uh, for, for one of these non undeserving kids, but he does it for a kid that he has finally been able to see is deserving of this kind of thing. And yeah. like it, it, it is, it is a, a fundamental shift in Giamatti's character, but in a way that just feels like completely earned, I think. Yeah. It's earned and it hits us on the, on the level where we care about it. Right. Cause yeah. it's, it's, um, he he found he found a true human human connection which was something he didn't have at all he had no yeah. friends in fact everyone around him hates him yeah um which is an incredibly lonely and miserable way to live your life but like he you know he he hates himself on some level obviously yeah. and all we really wanted to see for this guy was for him to like genuinely make a friend and and you and and you know that he genuinely loves this kid because he sacrificed his career and everything he knows, really, he kind of sacrificed his whole world for this kid. And um, you could argue that also over the course of the movie, he learned like one of the things that he learned in his arc was like, I am, I am in complete stasis here. This is not, this is not good for me. And he probably wouldn't have quit at least not for a long time if this hadn't happened, but this nicely just kind of shoves him out the door into the life that he um, you know, can go, can go tackle now. Yeah. And, um, and it leaves us in a, a state of hopefulness for him, right? Like yeah. we, like who knows what's going to happen, but, but he's going to get out there and try. And that's, that's more than we could say about anything. And yeah, I mean, it, it is like, he's such a, a Giamatti. So, so good at playing this particular kind of character who is an asshole, right? Like it, the thing I love about him is that it's not as if 
he doesn't have any friends and everyone hates him for no reason. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) He's an asshole. He treats everyone like shit. He doesn't talk normal yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I, I one of my favorite scenes is him at the 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 bar in the uh bowling place where right. he's, like these two guys like just commiserating about uh whatever that kind of bowling was i think it's like uh like uh, i don't know tiny pin it's, bowling uh, it's the um, wrong kind of bowling yeah <laughs> and they're just and he just I, like talks tells them this little factoid about saint nicholas and is yeah. like not speaking like anyone speaks and it, it's it's so good like you you totally understand why he's ostracized and why no one likes him and and a lot of that he's earned that um but he is immensely lonely and he has convinced himself that that is his ideal state actually you know that that mm-hmm. that like i i think he says it at one point is like you know i i've always really like the aesthetic of being alone um and i was like what the fuck does that mean Mm -hmm. that's not a real thing that people say uh you want to be around people you do like we can see it like uh, when he thinks the one when he finally convinces himself that the one teacher might be crushing on him um and and then it turns out no she has a boyfriend and here he is and they're making out like that that destroys him yeah that, right. that really messes him up because he he does indeed really want that human connection. He's just convinced himself that he doesn't. And it, it takes this kid to punch through that and and um, Divine Joy Randolph's character, who we definitely yeah. need to talk about. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so and and the kid for that matter, because um, I, I I'm excited to watch this actor's career. Um, he, yeah. he was there was a lot of subtlety um, and. I always find that that when you're sharing the screen with somebody of Paul Giamatti's caliber, it's very easy for your eyes to just stay on Paul Giamatti while while you're watching, you mm-hmm. know, because you're just mm-hmm. like, well, he he's he's going to be carrying the scene. We 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 know that because he's Paul Giamatti. But the, but the the kid there was there was a real depth. There was a real understanding of the character and and nuance. Um, um, and I really enjoyed. I, I don't know how old he actually is. I, I somehow doubt that he's actually like. 17 or whatever age he's actually playing but um but it, he was great um uh he is 21 okay well that's pretty young yeah oh and he was born in cherry hill which is like right near where i was born that's cool. wild yeah. um yeah uh he th- this is his first role ever um i think paul giamatti takes credit for kind of not not finding him but but pu- pushing him to um to audition because he saw this kid and and like what told him to audition the kid was afraid to audition because he had never acted before um but oh my god he's yeah he's he's one of those those rare moments where where that that seems like it doesn't happen in film as much anymore that you just like discover someone and they're just kind of incredible from the get-go mm-hmm. and, and and i think like I, I like honestly there were moments where i was like some line reads where i was like i can tell this is the first time you've acted before mm-hmm. Like th- there's some ways he read some lines, but like at his face acting, as you've so wonderfully dubbed it, like the the way he holds himself in scenes and the way he reacts in scenes, like he is he's got he's got it, man. He totally has it. Um, yeah. and and I I too am am very excited to see what he does after this because great 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 performance. Yeah, and then as far as the character, we we saw what we wanted to see for him where mm-hmm. all he kind of needed was a feeling like he wasn't alone in the world um yeah which yeah. he got which he, so. he, he was desperately hoping to get from his father mm-hmm. and he didn't get that from his father he got that mm-hmm. from from someone else from his surrogate father in, in giamatti's character which oh my gosh the the ending scene with them in front of the truck where he says you know keep your head up you'll get through this i mm-hmm. cried man i cried mm-hmm. And he says it's the same thing, and they're both almost crying, and uh, yeah. And then it's just a simple "see ya," which is yeah. just a kid, a kid thing to do to have this incredibly cathartic moment, and then just go "see ya." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a uh, good drama. Yeah. A fun fact about him um, is one of his first scenes in the movie was when he had to call on the phone, um, and he completely flubbed the scene. Because he didn't know how to dial on a rotary phone and no one thought <laughs> to tell him because he's 21 years old and has never seen a rotary phone before. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that's... <laughs> no one in the whole production thought to teach him how to do this. And I guess he was so new to this whole thing. He just like was afraid to ask. So he just completely <laughs> fucked the scene because he didn't know what to do. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I wonder what the cutoff is for that because I've definitely used a rotary phone. 
Um, yeah, but, but we're old, Matt. We're I know. same age as Paul Giamatti. <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about the the Divine Joy Randolph character, who I think is you know I think this this movie is like saying things about class, right? Mm-hmm. I, I think you know the, this is this is a very a very rich school with, with that that is attended by very powerful people that have very very big sway the whole thing is that like these people go to the school and then go on to to ivy league and and giamatti kind of hates all these people yeah. um and and we learn why at, at the end of the movie um but we have in this in, in this mix of these two men you know both of them both of them privileged in some way because they both went to the school and they both like Giamatti went to Harvard right like he was clearly privileged he didn't graduate for reasons that the movie makes clear but but he he got into Harvard and and was going to Harvard Mm -hmm. um and then in the middle of this you have the Mary Lamb character Divine Joy Randolph's character who is the the manager of the kitchen at the school and whose son was a student at the school um but graduated and could not afford to go to college so instead went to Vietnam and died over there and Mm -hmm. so like in the middle of this 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 kind of wrestling between two privileged people living this privileged life you have this woman who is spending her first christmas without her dead child and grieving for that loss and she is kind of that 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 catalyst i think of change in both of them i think you know it is it is them and each other certainly but like she kind of also serves as that you know that wake up call for these people that like the, the the problems you have are awful, right? They're, they they are, but you still have this immensely privileged life and you could be like, like I love that scene where, where Giamatti says like, Barton men don't go to Vietnam. And uh, Angus's response is, um, well, except for Curtis Lamb. And mm-hmm. he said, yeah, except for Curtis Lamb. And it's just this, this really like, not, not like, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's like an angry, indemnification of Mm -hmm. like the how all this works um but but one that like that's not what the whole movie is about but it's it's there throughout the movie yeah i i think it is under it's underlying everything i mean like so many of these characters are like assholes and they call each other assholes and they 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 use the word many times like it's and, and and it's um it, it, they're just all, all these guys who who are just so like defensive and, and basically like hateful toward each other are two you know main characters being examples of that but uh but kind of everyone is is an asshole in the movie yeah. actually but but like the, what i think one of the really important you know things that makes us see kind of a crack of humanity is when one of the kids says something like really just thoughtless and and cruel about like you know the the food sucks like we're paying her can't she do a better job yeah. and and Paul Giamatti just explodes at him and and there's various other scenes where you see Paul Giamatti's character like is kind to her um is genuinely sympathetic to her plight not just like giving lip service to the idea of you know he, he's not just like awkwardly like oh she lost her son i better like yeah be nice he's like he's actually mad about he, he's like sad for her he thinks this is unjust he's um uh and and that makes us like him too right so yeah um well because yeah. ultimately is it is it it is unjust right mm-hmm. it's like mm-hmm. you know we had this war going on and this draft going on and if you were privileged enough to be able to afford higher education uh, you were exempt from that idea Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. here you have this kid who had unlimited potential who did great in this this very difficult school but was just not quite privileged enough right um Mm -hmm. yeah and and so he gets to he gets to die for it and 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 yeah i mean i i think Giamatti's character Paul Hunnam is just angry at this whole system and and it's this really interesting contradiction in that he loves the school and and you believe and I think he means it when he says it that he loves Barton he loves the school he loves the the things that it represents and the the important role that it plays in in the molding of kids um but but he is kind of just witness to the corrupting influence of money and privilege on this whole thing and 
like because of because of his past, because of what happened at Harvard when the other guy stole his thesis and then used his privilege to make it so Giamatti stole his thesis and then yeah. so he he ran him over in a uh-huh. car. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah, I mean, which is great. But, Giamatti's yeah. character is basically an idealist who, yeah. and and the world has let him down. Yeah, um, yeah, and and this has given him a huge amount of resentment, and so he's he's continuing to work within the broken system, but he's not even working particularly effectively because he's just sort of lashing out at at every part of the system around him. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's supposed to be molding these kids, right? Like, like you you could argue that your job here is to is to uh, illuminate their privilege and teach them, you know, via history, you know, the same thing he says to, to, to Angus in the, the museum, which is like, you need to learn about this, this stuff in the past, because like, this is, this is you, this is now you have to understand the, the, the context for all these things, but that's not how he teaches in school, right? How he teaches mm-hmm. in school is, is very like this kind of, you know, there are times when I can't stand this guy either because of like his, his incessance on the most uh, absurd level of vocabulary possible, right? Yeah. Like he can't say, Hey, let me buy you a beer to smooth this whole thing over. He He's like, let me get a beverage for yeah. you and your friend to imbibe. Um, yeah. And then starts quoting fucking Latin and yeah. Greek at them. And it's just like, dude, come on, man. Like no one's really like this, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> he's he's incredibly sheltered is that like he's yeah. grown up in this in this sphere of privilege and i think he's aware of it but i think he's like he, he hides inside it um yeah yeah it's such an interesting sort of contradictory creature because as you say it's like he he resents everything about the privileged class in which he exists he resents everyone else like him yeah yeah <laughs> um and i think that's because he he kind of is fundamentally unlike them in some ways like he mm-hmm. I, I think there is sort of a core of I don't know what to call it exactly. Um, some sort of integrity, you could say, yeah. Um, that he just refuses to let go of, and um, uh, and, and he perceives everyone else as lacking in this integrity. And uh, uh, yeah, I think there's I think there's lots of support for that. Um, just since you know the movie basically starts with him refusing to to pass this kid. Um, mm-hmm. um, I, I I think you know he he did sort of get. It, it was a small moment. The movie didn't linger on it. I actually liked that the movie didn't linger on it and, and kind of make it try to make it a big, you know, a uh, uh, dr- dramatic moment. But, you know, the kids get back from break and he has told them before break, like, oh, we're canceling the the, the retest because mm-hmm. because I'm a huge asshole. And and then they get back and he's like, all right, we're going to take a quiz and then we're going to retake the test. And it just, just offhandedly is like, yeah, we we are going to retake the test. I changed my mind. Um, yeah, he doesn't even say I changed my mind. He's yeah. just like, we'll do this pop quiz and then we'll retake the test. Right. And right. yeah, yeah, he doesn't even have to say that. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I do think there is like if he if he had gotten the chance to if he'd gotten the chance to stay there. Right. I, I do think there's a I don't think he'd like turn into John Keating from Dead Poet Society. Right. Uh-huh. But I, I do think we would have perhaps seen a, a shift in how he approaches uh, the class and, and teaching and, and maybe a little bit more flexibility in in how he presents himself. But um, yeah, but I, I like this. I like this for him better. Speaking of yeah. Dead Poets Society, it's funny because I, I was like, as the movie was starting, I, I was thinking um, I did watch the trailer for this movie and I was like, the, the trailer seemed like more shouty and, <laughs> and less like this movie's fairly lighthearted. Um, yeah, yeah. The, tra- the trailer made it seem heavier. And, and I was like, is, uh, is this going to be a movie where somebody dies at the end and I'm going to yeah. be sad? Cause I, and, 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 and the answer is no, but the whole time, like the, the, the specter of dead poet society was hanging over me <laughs> where I was like, is this going to be one of those movies? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I think I, I told you this before we started recording, but I turned to my wife as we as they were traveling back from Boston. And it was kind of heading towards the the end of the film, and I just turned to her and said, "Something bad's going to happen." And mm-hmm. and the thing it, that I was thinking of in that moment was someone's going to die. Mm-hmm. Um, one of these three characters is going to die. It's going to be some sort of tragic accident, or like we do see that both the the um 
the, both the Giamatti character and Mary Lamb like drink a lot in mm-hmm. this movie. Like they're drinking a lot, and I, I, I was wondering if they it was going to be something with that that someone gets drunk and gets in a car accident and dies. Or, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I was I was definitely on the edge of my seat, being like, "Oh God, someone's going to die." And yeah. I am thankful that that's not where it went. But yeah, I think that. Uh, these type of movies have primed me for that possibility exactly and but and i think that would have cheapened like the, the careful you know human level stakes that we built up yeah. over the course of the movie where that's just um you can make such a good impactful story that really does make you feel these strong emotions like we've just been talking about where nobody dies you know like what what like a guy gets fired yeah (laughs) that's but but like what what you're what we're crying over is like oh they finally found one person they could have a human connection with um it's uh it it, which yeah that's it's great it's just a very um i think that's one of the things that i mean when i say they don't make movies like this anymore and again i'm 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 being i'm being silly because of course of course there are movies that have like low stakes yeah I'm i'm not saying there aren't but I feel like it's so everything these days is so epic and um, ends with like, you know, some orgy of cannibalism and, you know, <laughs> metaphorically speaking, it's like we're, we're, we're aiming for massive melodrama and like j- just something that will stick in people's memories yeah. with so many movies these days. And it's well, like, no, this is just a little movie about school. It's look, fine. I loved this movie. So mm-hmm. take take this take this this movie I'm about to talk about and understand that I deeply love this movie and it was one of my favorite movies of last year, if not my favorite movie of last year. But Everything Everywhere All at Once is a film about a mother and her daughter. Mm-hmm. But it is a film about a mother and her daughter and their relationship dripping in the 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 imagery of genre, right? Mm-hmm. It cannot just be a straightforward film about two people and their complicated relationship. It has to be that you know snuck into this big loud genre film and i love those type of movies i do i absolutely do we talk about how genre is is effective as a tool to like smuggle in these kind of character stories all the time and we love that stuff but like also sometimes you can just do the thing yeah. and have the movie just be about those things and i feel like we've forgotten that sometimes Mm -hmm. and and the only movies that get made are movies like like that that are that are using genre as a method of of smuggling this kind of thing in and and yeah i appreciate the simplicity and the straightforwardness of this just being a movie about three people that are sad and how they find strength in each other and really that's it that's it that's the movie yeah yeah, to just uh, pointlessly pile on everything everywhere all at once <laughs> with you. Like we were just talking last night on our um, bonus podcast about the TV show Castle Rock, and we were talking about what a great job it did at, at maintaining a consistent tone and not undercutting itself with jokes, even though it does have a little bit of humor. But it's like exactly the right dose of humor to kind of mm-hmm. just balance things out. It's just the 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 little you know the the bay leaf in the stew. <laughs> um and and um everything everywhere all at once I, I i felt that it suffered from this issue where it's like you're you're staring into this like kaleidoscope and you're trying to pick out the story from amidst the the noise very often and like and 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 on a tonal level it very often was kind of cacophonous um it's like it's like i i'm having i'm having so much trouble feeling the human level stakes of this mother daughter relationship in the midst of this explosion of dildos that's happening on the screen (laughs) and like it's very funny but like maybe maybe i don't need to be laughing in this moment like i don't need to be i don't need to be laughing all the time um sure and i I like that movie too i i just i feel like people these days like you say it's like i think (laughs) i don't know if this is reaching or not but it's, it's almost like people are competing with tiktok on on the phone in your hand so they're like we gotta put put more shit on the screen make more stuff be happening on the screen Mm -hmm. um and i had like very little trouble just like paying attention to this movie the entire time and there were no uh orgies of cannibalism or explosions of dildos and the whole the whole thing so 
just want you to say orgies of cannibalism and explosions of dildos just one more time. I, I'll try to fit it in somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, again, like, it, I, I guess, I guess, I kind of, I don't want to relitigate everything ever all at once. That's not what this <laughs> episode is about. Um, I, I kind of, I, I guess, I disagree that it it didn't function in that movie. Like I love that movie. Favorite movie of last year, right? Mm-hmm. But but yeah, I mean, I guess the the pushback I would have is that that just because that works and is effective um doesn't mean that that's the only way we can tell stories and and these stories are just as effective if not perhaps more so in some cases. I mean, I guess the question is did I enjoy this movie more than everything or ever all at once? And it's like I don't know. In some ways, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. In other ways, like the the ins- insanity of that film just floored me yeah. um but but yeah i mean i just want i just want a world in which both can exist and and that's the cool thing about this movie coming out a year after that movie right is that like mm-hmm. oh cool maybe i'm living in that world now maybe i'm living in that world where both of these things can exist simultaneously and both be nominated for best picture uh that movie won this one is probably not going to win that award um but but who cares who cares if it wins it's it's nominated like these these are two of the examples of the greatest uh that filmmaking gave us in these two years and they are so different from each other Mm -hmm. um and it's it's a cool like i we love to talk about the doom and gloom about about film um and i think it's a fair argument because movies have never been less integral to popular culture uh, in their history right now, right? Like it's it's never been as bad as as it is right now. However, movies are good. <laughs> they're really good right now. Like they're they're really good. This is a really really good movie, and it's like probably the the eighth best film on this list, possibly. Um, mm-hmm. and that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's uh, I'm I you know it's funny. I was. I don't know. I don't know if skeptical is, is the right word, but when we started on this project, I was like, "Oh, this is gonna be a bunch of boring, serious shit that I'm just not gonna enjoy, and it's 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 gonna be a slog to get through all these Oscar bait films." On some mm-hmm. level, like I was thinking, that wasn't my entire reaction. I I I, I did agree to do it with you, so <laughs> but 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 on on some level, I did have that feeling of like, uh, "Am I gonna regret this?" And um, I mean, so far. Definitely not. And in fact, I feel like I've learned something like I, I I have updated on the information of like, no, people still know how to make good movies. You're just like being way overly cynical by by you. I'm referring to me. I, I'm being way too overly cynical about like what um, what's coming out and what people yeah. like, because um, because, you know, as we've discussed, we, we, we don't we don't go out and watch that many movies, that many mm-hmm. new movies. Unfortunately. Um, yeah. 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 So. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think I think hold hold your horses on that a little bit. <laughs> the movie we're covering next week um, is I haven't seen it, so I don't want to prejudge it. But from everything I've seen, it's it's one of the ones that I think is most in line with uh, with what we would be what we traditionally call Oscar Beatty mm-hmm. um, type sad you know biopic type movie. like it so the movie is maestro is, mm-hmm. is the movie we're going to be covering next week it's the bradley cooper film um it is uh supposed to be pretty good but i mean is it is the the story of leonard bernstein and his uh relationship with his wife possibly um it is it's just like everything about it looks to me like oh this is an oscar movie and bradley cooper is very very desperate to win an academy award um mm-hmm. but, so mm-hmm. we'll see we'll see if, if if you change your mind about that with that one movie um that i, I now that like that was one of the ones that i was like kind of hoping would fall off the list and and something else would take its place uh but now that it's officially on we're gonna we're gonna rip the band-aid off and get it out of the way and then uh sure. and then move on to some of the other ones i'm a little more excited about but um yeah but you know we've gotten through four and i'm and yeah. i'm having a great time so far yeah definitely definitely um how how is your relationship with Alexander Payne, the director of this movie? Um, because I feel I feel very mixed on him a lot of the times. Well, it's, it's not a name that I have a strong association with. Is the truth? Okay. I think you you told me you reminded me that he directed um, Sideways, right? Yep. Or- so he directed Election, um, which is the 1990 um, Matthew Broderick Reese Witherspoon film. I don't know if you ever saw that one. Uh, no, I, oh. I don't think I did. That might be my favorite of his film. That is a 
fascinating little movie. Uh, I think it's one of Reese Witherspoon's first performances, and she's just an absolute powerhouse in that okay. movie. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, he directed Sideways. Um, he directed The Descendants, Nebraska. And Downsizing was his last film before this one, a movie that came out six years ago. That was, um, you probably saw the trailer for that one because I feel like they pushed the marketing on that one really, really hard. That was a Matt Damon film about how like they invented this technology where they could shrink you down to a tiny size and and therefore like in, if your normal life if you're middle class when you're tiny your money spends more so you basically become rich and it's, it's kind of seemed like a satire um it was a it was an awful movie it was a, it was really bad <laughs> doesn't sound like his thing um it, i mean it's a, a, another movie on this list that i was going to mention a second ago, actually didn't realize this was his, it was about Schmidt. Mm -hmm. Um, 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 the, um, Jack Nicholson movie. And, um, cause I was thinking like, that's another movie where the catharsis of the film is actually just like him utterly failing to make any kind of human connection for the entire movie. And then the last scene, he, he has like touched one person in a small way. And, that's like enough for you to be like, okay, you know, like his, his life wasn't totally meaningless. <laughs> yeah. And, um, uh, this movie is much more cheerful than about Schmidt. Um, yeah. but, um, it, but I mean, what, the, the reason I brought that up is like, it, it sounds like this is what he's good at and he tried to do something kind of weird and, and sci-fi well, he do, and it didn't He work. does like to do the, you know, middle-aged men, um, middle, unhappy middle-aged men trying to, trying to find out their what their purpose is and, and mm -hmm. rediscover meaning in their lives like that's that's election that's sideways for sure that's the descendants um that is about schmidt um that is even kind of downsizing but i think downsizing a movie that has the same problem that we just talked about which is it's doing that but it has to do it in the tropes of this like very specific uh almost genre type conceit of we're shrinking people down and it's it's got it's i saw that movie at fantastic fest i think it was the closing film of the whole festival and like uh, we walked out of that movie and we were like what the fuck was that that was it was bad and there's it that movie has some defenders like it, it really does like but i was kind of cautiously optimistic about the holdovers because of how bad my experience with downsizing was i was like mm -hmm. is this does this guy have it anymore did he lose it a little bit um and happy to be proven wrong because i think this is one of my favorite of his works for sure um really really and, and i do wonder like you know you know we, we joked at the beginning about how like sideways is a movie <laughs> with a character that is our age and how much that fucked my world up because i watched this matt movie in, in 2004 and it spoke to me when i was um geez i was 19 years old in, in <laughs> 2004 yeah um and and I I saw Sideways again recently, and it, oh my gosh, it speaks to me even more now that I'm the age of the character. And so part of me is like, I wonder if I'm gonna like watch the holdovers in in 15 years and be like, oh my god, oh my god, this is me. Obviously, it's not right. Like I like none of these Giamatti characters I particularly relate to like directly on any level. But like I think there's a part of yourself that is like, am I a jerk? And yeah, the, like there's a, the insecure, insecure part of yourself, like thinks you're the Giamatti character, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there, there's some of that. I mean, also, I think I think we like we, we love a good redemption story, um, sure. even if we don't necessarily relate. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I, th I think we all do relate somewhat. Um, there's also a sort of like fantasy of of being able to be that big of an asshole and get away with it. Yeah, um, yeah. But um. I think anyone that's ever like thought about if they would want to be a teacher has thought about being the asshole teacher that gets to fail all the shitty kids that don't deserve to pass. Like I feel mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. That's definitely a fantasy that I've thought about is like, yeah, fuck you <laughs> stupid kid. Enjoy your F. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's one of the, uh, just the lights of the movie is watching him like have his power trips yeah, where yeah. he's just, you know, when, when he, there's a couple of scenes that jump to mind, like the one where he's in the classroom, it's like he's he's kind of the most alive when he's in front of the class and he's just torturing <laughs> them. And he's just being so evil and just delighting in like, oh, oh, I'm sorry you don't get to go to Cornell now and I've ruined your <laughs> life. Um, and he like really, really enjoys it. 
Um, and then also there should know more about Carthage, which yeah. doesn't exist anymore. Right. This is the most important thing in the world. And I'm going to yeah. grade incredibly hard for some reason. Um, and then there's the scene where two of the boys have a fight and then he like, you know, practically waterboards them into confessing by he does the Roman. Yeah. The Roman yeah. legion method. Yeah. 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 That's, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, it, it is. It is delightful kind of watching this stuff. And I, our introduction to the character is him grading papers. I forget the line he says while he's grading papers, but he's just like looking at these papers and calling these kids names as he marks up their paper with so much red ink. Like he takes delight. And and, and we, we kind of learn why. I think that's the like his his hatred of of these type of people doesn't come from nowhere. It is it is behavior that that, you know, he was reinforced by the events of his life. Um, yeah. But yeah. but he gets better in the end because instead he starts sticking it to the man, not the boys. That's right. That's right. <laughs> There's just this one tiny little moment that I just thought was delightful toward the beginning where he's he's in the office of, of like the, the headmaster and he's and he says something in Latin or, or Greek, I guess Latin. And the, and the headmaster is like, is that uh, Cicero? And then Paul Giamatti is just like utterly delighted. And he's like, oh, very good good you remembered and, and he says it in this tone of like c- complimenting his student for getting the right answer mm-hmm. and and the headmaster just gives him this look of like <laughs> barely contain rage and shock at the same time that he would speak yeah. to him this way it's just a great interaction yeah um, well i mean that relationship is so delightful because we learned that that it was a student right that like yeah. you know this is he's now your boss but he was your student once upon a time and it shows that you have gone nowhere in your life and everyone's mm-hmm. passing you by the same with where he runs into the old friend at harvard and has to immediately make up that lie which is a great scene <laughs> ancient cameras <laughs> ancient cameras i had to keep you on your toes <laughs> uh-huh <laughs> yeah yeah and then it comes up with the name <laughs> light and magic <laughs> in the ancient world uh. <laughs> I, I wonder i wonder this is this might be me officially reading too much into this film but i wonder if there is something that like the thing that giamatti's character seems the most um obsessed with in the ancient in ancient history is carthage mm-hmm. um a a city state that used to be one of the most powerful influential um empires i guess we'll call in the ancient world uh but was utterly devastated and ultimately burned down by the romans and Mm -hmm. ceased to exist like he seems very specifically into into carthage but yeah like who who lost the punic wars and like that i mean i feel like it said that says something yeah i i agree i i I like where your head's at i didn't think of that but yeah he he does talk about carthage a lot Mm -hmm. for sure it's like, yeah, the, the Punic, the, the Punic Wars did not go well for the people of Carthage yeah, at I, all. I, 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 yeah, he, he identifies with the besieged, mm-hmm. uh, you know, ultimate loser of of the inexorable conflict against the far more powerful Rome. But uh, mm-hmm. he, he's he's not gonna he's not gonna surrender though. Um, <laughs> nope. And they didn't either. But they mm-hmm. they all they all died. Yeah. It's that Romans. Rome, man. You can't beat it. Yeah. Can't, can't beat him, join him is kind of the idea, actually. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else you wanted to say about the holdovers? I think we've spent less time on this movie than the others. And I think that's just a result of it being you know, ultimately a, a, a fairly simple story, yeah. uh, which doesn't make it a bad story, certainly. No. no, I mean, I think, you know, we, we did talk a little bit about sort of the themes and the greater social statement of the movie. But the, the, one thing all the other movies that we've talked about have is there is a separate sort of cultural conversation that they're playing into. Yeah. Whereas this movie, again, it's not saying nothing, right? We, we, we did talk about it, but it's not, it's not speaking to the moment in the same way. Where, right. Um, right. And, and that's, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Um, I think the only other thing I'll say is divine joy. Randolph is about to win an Academy award. Like she's, <laughs> she's going to win for this role, like almost certainly. And that's pretty cool. I think she's a great actress. I've seen her in other things. Um, I've never seen her in a dramatic role. She's been in, um, she's been in some comedies that I've watched and and enjoyed her in those roles. She's doing something a little bit interesting here, Matt, because like she's kind of got. Did you detect like a little bit of a Boston accent in her, but mm-hmm. not like, but it only showed up in certain words, and it almost to the point that it made it seem more realistic to me. 
Mm-hmm. That like it's only like she it's only when she says certain words and certain vowel sounds that the Boston in her comes out. Um and it, it does like differentiate her. I mean, besides the color of her skin, which the you know, there's there's no black people at the school except for her son who's dead. Um and like but she, like no one talks in that accent at the school. Like everyone's very, very proper and mm-hmm. and especially especially Giamatti's character. Um and it is another way of of separating her and segmenting her out from from everyone else Mm -hmm. yeah i i I don't think i consciously uh clocked the the accent thing but i i did notice like the the sort of way she the the way that she spoke was something i noticed yeah they really spent a lot of effort making giamatti's character not only in unlikable personality wise but like aesthetically (laughs) Uh the the lazy eye thing and then you know, he, he talks about two conditions he has, one that makes his hands sweaty and then the other that just makes him smell by the end of the day yeah. because his body can't like process a certain protein or something. Yeah, I mean, like, it, it, so it, on, it, I thought that was really interesting because it's it's sort of this on this line between comedy and tragedy, right? Yeah, Where it's yeah. like it, it it's over the top where it's like, seriously you have you have (laughs) all of these conditions that make you like basically just unpleasant to be around in different ways Mm -hmm. and um and 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 hard to interact with and um and and so you do feel for him but also it's it's kind of piling on in a way that feels comedic actually yeah i i guess maybe as a critique is it necessary like that's a thing like we we already established him as unlikable um and and understand why people don't want to be around him but like is it actually necessary to like make him like physically disgusting to be around as well like I, I, it feels like piling on in a way that yeah. almost goes above and beyond what is necessary well, but i guess maybe it helps garner sympathy because those aren't things he can control really yeah i don't know I, I, i'm thinking about the scene you know beat three i guess where he he you know very like earnestly and just kindly from his heart like take takes um takes her hand when they're sitting Mm -hmm. in the car together and it's just like it's a spontaneous heartfelt gesture he's you know he's not being he's not calculating he's not being a weirdo and it like grosses her out because his hand is all like sweaty and cold yeah And, and and i think that was that was like the saddest of the moments to me actually. Cause it's like, ah, like he was, he was just trying to like have like show some human kindness. And even that is rebuffed and, yeah. and, and the way he reacts to it, like he doesn't even get sad. He's, he's, it's almost like he's just like expecting to be rebuffed. Um, and I think that just, I, I can't answer the question of whether it's necessary or whether it's too much, but that particular moment where it's just like, man, like everything, everything about this guy's like body is stacked against him. And, um, and it does build some sympathy, like you said, and it makes you understand like, yeah, I, I kind of see how you would end up behaving the way this guy behaves. If, yeah, if, if like every, every just sort of like normal convenient way of interacting with people is sort of cut off from you. Yeah, the the movie kind of turns it into a joke when Angus says like Jesus, no wonder you're afraid of women. But like, yeah, right? Like right. like if, if you had this condition where by the end of the night you smell like fish and there's nothing you can do about it, like that is going to really really hurt your confidence in the romance department. Right. Jesus, I have enough trouble being confident in the romance department and I <laughs> I smell fine, I think. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so yeah, I mean, like it, it does kind of move towards an understanding of of you know why he's kind of placed himself in this you know self appointed exile because he's gotten reinforcement of this again and again and again. I agree with you that that moment with with uh, her in the in the car, like it broke my heart a little bit because yeah, he he just wanted to help her. He just felt bad, like he, she's he just you know like it's yeah. just and yeah immediately rebuffed and then like there's that beautiful moment with her and and uh and angus at the at the end of the movie where like he's waiting there wondering that if he's about to get expelled which means military school and she more than anyone in the entire world knows what that could possibly mean for him right mm-hmm. um and so she just grabs his hand and holds his hand and it's like that's a wonderful kindness and and gesture and and a uh, way to 
physically dis- or uh, visually display that she gets it and is there for him. Um, and it's like, oh, he can't do that because if he did that, they'd be grossed out by it. Yeah, that's true. That's but they point. do shake hands at the end of the movie, like they they do. So, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, that is uh, we, that is the holdovers. Um, great film. It's playing right now on Peacock. I think it's still in theaters and in, in some places as well. Uh, but I I would strongly recommend you guys check this one out if you if you happen to have made it to the entire end of this conversation and have not seen it. Uh, really, really good. Happy to see it nominated. Yeah. Very enjoyable movie. Do 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 do. Doof. Speaking of nominations, Matt, they're in. They're here. Yay. They did it. All of them? Uh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> they release them all at once, Matt. That's, oh. that's, how, that's how it works. I just think you could build up more hype if you kind of release them in batches. I, I guess. Um, but people have to vote. They need time to vote. I guess. They need time to watch the movies and vote on them. Fine. So, Okay. I don't want to. We're not going to talk about every nomination. Uh, like we already talked about the the best picture and the, the ten films that we are covering on the show are the ten films nominated for best picture. Those movies, once again, if you've forgotten, are um, American Fiction, Anatomy of a Fall, Barbie, The Holdovers, Killers of the Flower Moon, Maestro, Oppenheimer, Past Lives, Poor Things, and The Zone of Interest. Uh, so four of the movies we've covered so far, and six for us to go on. Um. The the thing I, I don't I don't want to talk about the snubs too much, Matt, because I I feel like we get bent out of shape about snubs too much. Uh huh. Yeah. Because it's just not that interesting of a conversation yeah, to me. Yeah. Like it's it's whatever. It's it's. So all, I it's I, all I will up. say like the most surprising thing to me that happened was that Greta Gerwig was not nominated for directing for Barbie. Um. And there's a whole bunch of people that are like, how could that be? How could it be that that she, her movie was nominated for Best Picture, but she's not nominated for Best Director? And I'm like, folks, Best Picture has 10 slots in it. Yeah. <laughs> best Director d- doesn't. It has five slots. So that that's how. The The truth is that on, a, on people's list, Barbie was probably like, on the, on the majority of people's lists, probably like in the seven or eight or ninth best film of the year for them right Mm -hmm. uh which would land it perfectly in the best picture category because it has 10 slots but when we get to directing not so much um i will say i did think that greta gerwig was had had kind of reached the status of when she directs a movie she's going to get nominated for an academy award like there are several directors that have that like martin scorsese is a great example nolan too really um he's never won one but he he feels like if he makes a movie and releases a movie it's going to be nominated that year um, I, I thought Gerwig had achieved that level, uh, but I guess I guess not. Um, I will say there was there was a, a woman nominated for uh, directing, which is the only the eighth time that's happened. Um, and it was a, a woman named Justin uh, Trier, uh, who is the director of Anatomy of a Fall movie we're going to be watching here in a few weeks. Um, so that's cool. Um, it, it, it's cool to see that happen. It I think I think one interesting thing is that only one other woman has ever been nominated twice for an Oscar in Mm -hmm. directing. Uh, And that's Jane Campion has been nominated for two films. So this would have been Gerwig's second directing nomination. So she would have been number two in that list. But uh, instead uh, we got uh, Justin Trier in Anatomy of Fall. Scorsese was of course nominated. Nolan was nominated. Yorgos Lanthimos was nominated for Poor Things. And then Jonathan Glazer was nominated for The Zone of Interest. So um Again, all movies that we're going to, we've already watched or are going to be watching, um, and a, and a good list of directors there for sure. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't. The, the only name I don't recognize is Jonathan Glazer. I, I don't. I can't think of anything else he's directed. Did you watch uh, the Scarlett Johansson film? Um, oh my god, why am I blanking on the film now? It, where she plays an alien. Yeah. Um. Uh. Under the skin. Under that the skin. Him? Yeah. Okay. That's him. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. So if that tells you maybe what uh, what <laughs> zone of interest is going to be about a little bit, possibly makes not me... about, but but how it feel, how it's going to feel. Well, to watch it. Yeah, that makes me way more excited about zone of interest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I mean, it's cool. Again, I, I I love Greta Gerwig, and I I can't wait to see what she does. And like the the thing, <laughs> the Oscars do matter. They certainly do matter because these like if you are if you are new 
to this career and are trying to build, you know, capital, um, the uh, having an Academy Award nomination can really help you in your career. Uh, Greta Gerwig doesn't need that anymore. Like the thing that's helped her in her career is she made a billion and a half <laughs> dollar right. movie and is basically going to get to do whatever she wants, at least yeah. for the the next the next few years. So, right. Um, yeah, it would have been nice to see for her, but uh, you know, not a huge deal at the end of everything. Yeah, and I mean, you know, people do use the language of of snubs. They say it's a snub, and it's like, yeah. no, it's they, they do a ranking and then they pick the top whatever. Yeah, and that's how like that's just how rankings work. Like if if Greta Ger- Gerwig had been on the list, then do, do we say that the person who she bumped off was snubbed? Yes. Like, no, it's just <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, they they would say that, but it's like. Yeah, that's just not how that's just not a useful way to think about this, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I think the biggest the biggest uh, (laughs) thing that people were talking about this week was that Ryan Gosling got nominated for acting in Barbie and uh, Margot Robbie did not. Um, and that was like the biggest, like, like, oh, the, how you missed the the Academy missed the entire point of the movie by honoring Gosling and not honoring Margot Robbie. And I'm just like, folks, that's not how this thing works, uh-huh. though, actually. Like, there's not like a cabal of 12 people sitting in a room deciding who the nominees are. It's it's thousands of Academy members all uh not like doing ranked choice voting like right. that. That's how it works. So. I thought Margot Robbie was excellent in Barbie and I would have loved to see her nominated, but like I thought Emma Stone was really good in poor things, you know, like I thought Lily Gladstone and killers of the flower moon was amazing. And it's like, there are five slots and like a thousand movies of great performances. So like, this is how it's going to work sometimes. Like no one, no one voted for Ryan Gosling's performance in Barbie, which was excellent to snub Margot Robbie. Like that's not how, any of this works at all right well and and also just like if you walk up to like any random american and you're like give me your top choice for best supporting actor of a movie from last year they're gonna be like (laughs) well ryan gosling obviously (laughs) like it's it's not even ambiguous right yeah so so that's that's i just think his performance is more noticeable like yeah the things that he did good in that performance stand out like more than Margot Robbie who had to transform herself into the living embodiment of a doll, which is extremely difficult. And she did a wonderful job at it, but it just doesn't stick out as much as him singing. I'm just Ken. Like that was that noticeable. And that's sometimes all it takes to get nominated for these things. Yeah. Yeah. I I watched a video today that just highlighted how much he's, he's acting like a child. Um, (laughs) And, and like literally like, like, when they go to the real world and, and like Barbie's sitting at the bus stop, he's like s- sort of treating the bus stop like a jungle gym. Uh-huh. Um, and there's just so much stuff like this where they like throughout the video, they just show like, you know, dozens of examples of, of just little, little choices he's making. Anyway, yeah, it's just, it's, it, it's, a, he, he's, he deserves it. So, yeah. you know, but he, he's you know. not going to win the award anyway. So like we're, we're overreacting for no reason. Like he's, <laughs> he's nominated for Barbie. He's not going to win for Barbie. Uh, the nominators in supporting role nominees, sorry, in supporting role, by the way, are Robert De Niro and killers, of the flower moon, Robert Downey Jr. And Oppenheimer Gosling, as we mentioned, Mark Ruffalo and poor things, which uh, is a movie you're going to see here in a bit, Matt. And Holy shit. Ruffalo's performance in this movie. Oh my God. I can't wait till you see it. <laughs> Okay, And then uh, last, Sterling K. Brown for American Fiction. Sterling K. Brown was like the surprise in this category. Um, he's he's great, and I and I love him and everything he's been in, but he was not one that I, I would have predicted was going to make it here. I've not seen this movie. We'll watch this. Another one we're going to be watching here in a bit, but uh, he's supposed to be really good in it. And and uh, unfortunately, I don't think he's going to win. I think it's I think it's Robert Downey Jr. Like it's the the narrative here seems to be lining up for 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 Robert. So. That's interesting. I I don't know. I don't understand the dynamics of the of the academy that well. I I th- I think like, well, I guess I'll have to see these other movies before I can really yeah make a pick. You know. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, let me be clear here. Some some like it's politics and it's money mm-hmm. and it's also narrative, right? Like Robert Downey Jr. winning for this is the the academy and Hollywood getting to tell it's a story of this guy, you know, coming back from from you know, drug abuse and jail, um, you know, 
taking on this Marvel powerhouse and and bringing it to glory and then getting the freedom to do more interesting more challenging roles and succeeding at them like that's yeah. just a, a wonderful narrative that almost writes itself and uh and that's what they like to do sometimes yeah. so you know i i parenthetically here i saw i saw a, a headline that was like downey jr um feels like he's actually put in a lot of his best work in the marvel films and it's generally been just l- overlooked because of the genre mm-hmm. and and i i honestly agree with him um yeah i've always thought that his performances in the marvel movies were very strong like even if the movie that he was in wasn't necessarily my favorite movie um he was always giving his all and yeah. um he's he is such a big part of the reason for that whole franchise's success and um yeah i don't know just wanted to comment on that briefly yeah completely agree totally um so actress in a supporting role, by the way, we have Emily Blunt in Oppenheimer. We have Danielle Brooks in The Color Purple. I think this is like the only nomination for The Color Purple, which is a, a musical adaptation of that that earlier film um, that unfortunately no one's talking about. And and this is one of the ones that I thought might sneak into the Best Picture nomination, but it didn't. Um, another surprise is America Ferreira in, in Barbie. I was not expecting this. Um, I guess you give like one really good speech that that speaks to a lot of people's experience and people like you. Um, uh-huh. so, so she's nominated uh, Jodie Foster for Nyad, a movie that I've barely heard of, but she's supposed to be very good in it. And then, of course, Divine Joy Randolph in The Holdovers. Uh, that's you know, she's going to win that one for sure. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we've got a bunch of noms for for Nyad for for different things, but we're, yeah. it's, it's not on our best picture list. So Mm-mm. we're not going to watch it. That happens sometimes with this stuff. Um, yeah, so to move to actress in a leading role, uh, you know, we have Emma Stone in Poor Things, Carrie Mulligan in Maestro, Sandra Hewler in Anatomy of Fall, Lily Gladstone in Killers of the Flower Moon, and then Annette Benning in Nyad. The Annette, the Annette Benning no- nomination is the one that surprised people. Mm-hmm. Um, that you know, this was the this is the spot. I think they thought that Margot Robbie would probably get it in and in, in Annette Benning stole her spot and it mm. become it's one of those ones that like is this is this about this role in particular or is this a honoring a person's very lengthy career because Annette Benning has been working in Hollywood for years and years and years and I don't think ever won a, an award so mm-hmm. um she's been nominated five times for Oscars but she's never won so it's like oh this is an op- the, again you know we're talking narrative here sometimes this is just how it works yeah yeah but I think I think Lily Gladstone's going to win that one, um, okay. which I would be completely happy with. It would be the I think this is the first uh, Native American woman nominated for uh, leading actress ever. So it's a pretty big awesome. deal. Yeah, oh, that's uh, amazing. Yeah, uh, I, there is uh, there is an Emma Stone Poor Things uh, contingent saying that that this movie is gaining traction though. It got a lot of nominations, and so if anyone's going to steal Lily Gladstone's moment, it could be Emma Stone. But we'll see. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean. Can't really comment until I've seen it. Sure. Uh, actor in a leading role, uh, Bradley Cooper and Maestro. We'll watch that next week. Uh, Coleman Domingo and Rustin. This is another one of those not nominated in any of the big awards, but some, this I guess this one person had a really good performance, and mm-hmm. so it's here. These happen in the acting categories every so often, Matt. Like um, Renee Zellweger won for the movie Judy, which was a... a um, uh, God, why am I blanking? I don't remember. Uh, oh, it was about Judy Garland. That's who it was. Oh, okay. It was it was like a biopic about Judy Garland, and the movie like got nominated for no awards, but she got nominated for actress and won. Um, so that, that happens sometimes. Mm, that's funny. Okay, cool. Uh, Paul Giamatti got nominated for the Holdovers, which is great. Uh, yeah. Killian Murphy got nominated for Opp- Oppenheimer, and then Jeffrey Wright for American Fiction. So. Uh, right now, right now, the narrative is that Killian Murphy has this thing in the bag. So we'll see. Yeah, I, I lean heavily toward that. Um, mm-hmm. I, I will be pretty surprised. I mean, I, again, hard to say until you've seen some of these other movies, but yeah. it's just like it's, it blew me away. really did. The the other thing I wanted to talk about uh, and then we'll wrap everything up is animated feature. Um, so Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse was nominated in anim- anim- animated feature, which is great. But like, I have a question for you, Matt, and maybe you know the answer to this. Maybe you don't. But how many times has an animated film been nominated for Best Picture? I don't know the answer to that. The answer is three. Okay. Total. 
1993, Beauty and the Beast was nominated for Best Picture, and the Academy was so upset about it that the very next year they introduced a new animated feature film category. <laughs> mm-hmm. It said, get those the fuck out of our Best Picture category. And since then, only two films have been nominated for Best Picture, Pixar's Up and Pixar's Toy Story 3. That's mm-hmm. it. And I'm not saying that Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is one of the 10 best films of the year and should have been nominated for Best Picture. I haven't seen all these movies that no- were nominated instead of it. Maybe that's the case. But like, it is kind of ridiculous that we still look at animation in at least in the academy as this like other thing mm-hmm. that we really unless it breaks through in a way like up like made people cry and toy story made people cry like we don't we don't ever even consider these movies really for best picture and it kind of right. drives me insane sometimes yeah yeah i mean i i don't know if this is a, a good explanation but i i think about the fact that the academy awards are sort of marketing and a lot of it is basically like how, how can we best serve as a vehicle for promoting the filmmakers and actors and and the, the people who make these films. And if you're going to go to all that effort, and then you give the movie, you give the award to an animated film. Not that animated films don't have actors, but you you know what I mean, right? <laughs> like like the 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 apparatus of Hollywood is not built yeah. around animation. Um, so it kind of feels like, Hey, well, why did we, um, invest all of this money and attention in the, uh, Academy Awards? If you're just going to give the award to the animated show. Um, yeah, I think that's a little silly, but I totally get that, that, that feeling that they might have. Yeah. 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 Again, I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm like over rationalizing it and it is just as simple as like, can't take cartoons seriously. <laughs> um so a couple other quick things um i'm just ken was nominated for original song which fingers crossed means ryan gosling will perform at the academy awards Mm -hmm. i hope so we'll see i do too i do too they nominated two barbie songs uh the other one was the billy eilish one what was i made for they didn't they didn't nominate the dua lipa dance the night away one which Mm -hmm. i thought that was a pretty good song too Instead, they nominated a song called The Fire Inside from Flamin' Hot, the true story of the origin of the Flamin' Hot Cheetos. Wow. I'm being serious. That I'm, This isn't a joke. Well, we got to listen to this song, man. It's probably awesome. <laughs> um, Wes Anderson was nominated for The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar in live action short film. I just wanted to point that out. That's good. Uh, yeah. He was not nominated for his movie that came out this year because... Nobody but me loves Wes Anderson, apparently. I, uh, I'll watch it, Scott. <laughs> yeah, I've told you it's available like six months ago. I know, but then you put all these other movies on my calendar, and <laughs> when am I supposed to watch things? Look, if you really loved Wes Anderson, you'd find a way. It's true. It's true. No, no, the truth about me and Wes Anderson is that his movies always demolish me. And oh. I don't necessarily want to have like, and and I love them, but I don't necessarily want to do that to myself. Don't worry, Matt. This is a happy one. Uh huh. I I don't believe you at all. So it's so happy. Uh-huh. It's so happy. Okay, great. That's uh, this is not <laughs> helping. <laughs> we'll watch. We'll watch it eventually. Um, but yeah, that's. I think that's all I wanted to talk about Academy Award wise right now. Um. I feel like the overall consensus is it, it it is a very unsurprising list of nominees. Like there wasn't a lot of shocking things. And a lot of these categories right now feel like they're locked in. Like I think everyone kind of says Oppenheimer's gonna win Best Picture and Nolan's gonna win Best Director, that that Killian Murphy's gonna win, that uh Daddy Jr.'s gonna win, that Lily Gladstone's gonna win, that Divine Joy Randolph's gonna win. Like those are the the, the six biggest categories. And everyone th- that I see is pretty confident that those are gonna go down exactly that way. And we're still, what, six weeks out from the awards. So mm-hmm. it is possible that those narratives change and shift over the next six weeks, but uh it could make for a predictably possibly boring show if if everything goes that way but kind of, you know yeah. i will say people have been pretty convinced of certain victories before and uh that, that did not happen we all we all remember the the famous anthony hopkins <laughs> since of 2021 um 
I don't exactly recall what the what the role was, but um, I don't remember the role was. But he he won over Chadwick Bosman, who everyone was convinced was going to win posthumously because he passed away. Uh huh. And then and he wasn't even there. Yeah, yeah. Well, he yeah Hopkins wasn't there. Well, and yeah. they they moved the awards around, so they always finish with best picture. But this time they finished with best lead actor because uh-huh. the Academy was so convinced that that Bozeman was about to win and they thought it would be a great like capping moment on the awards to and then he didn't win and it was the worst, most awkward thing ever. Yeah. They had to call him on the phone, woke him up. He was in Wales. <laughs> yeah. Held the phone up to the microphone. No, no. So we could always have something happen. like that. We could always have uh the wrong uh the wrong film being yep. called out as winning, you know, yep. all the classic screw ups of old we could yeah. hope for. Hopefully we can get a new one this time. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, that's it, though. The Oscars are coming out in six weeks and and we will we'll, we'll, we'll be there. We're going. We're going to the Academy Awards. <laughs> We've got the invite. Um, Whoa. What? <laughs> yeah, huh? I didn't tell you that. Huh? You what? haven't booked your plane ticket yet? Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, you know, I can't imagine something that sounds less fun to me than actually <laughs> actually going to them like i mean yes it would be cool to like see celebrities and meet people but it sounds really exhausting it's an exhausting yeah. show to watch when you're on the couch yeah i know i'm always impressed by the stamina of all these stars who who are sitting like in this like perfectly picturesque way knowing that the camera could turn on them at any moment and i'm just imagining myself being at that award show and I'd be like lounged back in my chair, like, <laughs> like slumped with my shoulders up and like, like with my mouth hanging open, probably possibly picking my nose. And unless like the actors just like they're perfect the entire time, Our, hours. Yeah. They're totally perfect. I mean, that's um, why they're the superstars and yep. uh, we do audio content. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. All right, folks, that's all we had for you this week. Uh, Let us know if you've seen The Holdovers, what you thought of it, or what your thoughts on the Academy Award nominations are. Uh, You can reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com, over on Twitter at doofmedia, or uh, on Reddit at reddit.com slash r slash doofmedia. Yeah, and if you're not already subscribed to the Doofcast, then please do so, and you'll never miss an episode. You can find us on all of the major podcasting platforms. If you like what we do here and want to support us, consider becoming a patron of Doof Media. You can head on over to patreon.com slash doofmedia and pledge at any of the available levels to get a whole bunch of bonus content, extra features, cool things, just uh, just and, and just, you know, sleep well knowing that you're helping us out. That's right. Also, please consider rating and reviewing the Doofcast on Apple Podcasts. Each review helps us get more exposure and introduces new people to the content that we make here. That's right. And that's going to do it for us this week. Next week, as we already said, we are taking a look at our fifth film nominated for Best Picture. It is Bradley Cooper's Maestro, and it is available right now on Netflix if you want to watch it and react along with us. So that's what we'll be doing next week, and we will see you then. Yep. And you'll do what I say. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say.